Thank you very much. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here in uh, Stockholm. It's my first visit to Sweden, so um, it's quite exciting for me. Um, and uh, I really like to say thank you to Michael for inviting me to present here. Uh, Fishbase is a tool that I use all the time in my job and all of my colleagues do as well. So it's a, it's a great honor to be able to present um, to you today. Um, my talk is about developing the European Regional Collection Plan for Freshwater Fishes. And um, this is based around uh, an ongoing process within the European zoos and aquariums, uh, a process called regional collection planning. So I'm going to be talking about that today. I'll be talking a bit about what the regional collection plan is, um, who it's for, and why it's needed very briefly. And then I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about how it's created um, and uh, specifically how we started creating it for freshwater fishes. So in RCP, what is it? Um, it's a common acronym. The zoo world loves acronyms. So I'll be calling it RCP throughout this uh, presentation. It's an aid for collection planners when they're trying to choose species. So people that work in zoos and aquariums have to develop a collection plan. The regional collection plan helps them in that process. And it's meant to be a complete review of a specific taxonomic group. So the example here shows um, the Calatricidae, which are the marmosets and tamarins, and this was the first regional collection plan developed for them in 2006. So it reviews all of the species within a taxonomic group. And it's a list of all those species for which regional collaboration is considered beneficial. So it's very different from an institutional collection plan. This is the one where we need to collaborate across multiple institutions, usually across multiple countries within a region. And it categorizes those species by the role that they play in a public collection. So that's another very key component of an RCP. There's been a lot of discussion about and worry from some zoo and aquarium practitioners about what the RCP is meant to do. And it's not meant to be an inventory or list of all the species kept in an individual collection. That's the job of the institutional collection plan. So it's not the same as the ICP. And it's definitely not a static or unchanging document. As new information becomes available, the RCP evolves and it changes. So who is it for? Well, it's obviously for people like me, aquarium curators, making decisions about the species in their collections. But it's also for our directors and the aquarists and educators, researchers and students that work in our collections. But it's also for people outside of the zoo community, for the hobby groups, potential monitors and coordinators, and, of course, our visitors and wider audiences. So the regional collection plan is available for everyone. Why do we need it? Um, well, we need to identify priorities for species. The uh, decline in biodiversity around the world today means that we really, really need to start prioritizing those species that would benefit from captive management as part of their conservation. And by working together, it allows um, an improvement of captive breeding and our captive management techniques and encourages cross-country collaboration when we've learned that we can share those techniques with each other. And of course, it brings ultimately a greater purpose to zoo and aquarium collections. We're not just menageries that we were 30, 40 years ago, but we actually have a much more um, important role to play. So how do we create the RCP? For people like me that work with highly speciose taxa, um, it's no easy task. You know, I mentioned the Calatricidae, they had sort of 30 species to sort through. When we look at freshwater fishes, we're talking about over 14,000 species. Um, and of course, within the zoo and aquarium community, there's a limited number of people able to do the work and a limited number of places. Within EASA, the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums, we have about 345 institutions. Of course, not all of those have aquariums. And of those that have aquariums, not all of them work with freshwater fish, for example. So it's a very small pool, which has meant we've had to go outside in some cases um, when we're developing our RCP. Because of these challenges, um, the, the lower vertebrate and invertebrate tax on advisory groups decided to join forces starting back in 2003 at a meeting in Prague followed by two more meetings, 2004 in Riga and 2005 in Randers. 
in which we looked at the regional collection planning process more closely. Previously, it was kind of led by mammal and bird people, and we know that the formulas that they were using weren't necessarily working for us. So our three tags shared this common problem, and we worked for many, many hours in between the meetings to try and redraft, which was ultimately this, which was in, produced in 2005, and it's the lower vertebrate and invertebrate tax and advisory group manual for regional collection <coughs> planning. Now, I'm very proud to say that after we rolled this out, the mammal and bird people started to go, mm, actually, that's quite good, and we might adopt some of that ourselves. So it's actually been rolled out on a, a larger scale within EASA. So the manual has many things in it, um, and one of the key things that it does is it defines the role that a species plays in our collections. It also uses a decision tree, which I'm going to go through in a minute, to help us sort through the species and decide whether or not they actually should form part of the RCP, and if so, what role they play on that. And ultimately, it provides a, a template for an action plan. So after a species has been decided that it is part of the regional collection plan, um, we then develop the action plan. What are we gonna do with that species? What, um, what, is, what are we gonna, in terms of programs? So, what role does a species play in our collections in the regional basis? Well, there are three main roles, conservation, research, and education. Display is not considered to be a role. So although um, many zoos and aquariums will have to have those big charismatic species uh, in our collections, tigers and so forth, it doesn't necessarily mean that they form part of a regional plan. Um, if they're a display limited species, they're not really considered part of the RCP they may factor in on the ICP of an individual collection, however. I'm gonna go through those different categories in a little bit more detail, um, so you have a greater understanding of those categories. So the first one, conservation, which I'm gonna focus on more, has several subcategories underneath it, and the first one is, is ARC. Um, you know, not to have a big biblical um, thing, but ARC was seemed to be the word that was easy enough for everybody to understand. So those are species that are globally extinct in the wild and which would become completely extinct if it weren't for ex situ management. Here's an example of one of my favorite fish, the uh, pupfish. And there are many species of pupfish and quite a few other species of freshwater fish that would be completely extinct right now if it weren't for the role of hobbyists and zoos and aquariums maintaining them for the long term um, in captivity. The second group is the rescue group, again under conservation. And these are species that are in imminent danger of extinction, either locally or globally, and are managed in captivity as part of their recommended conservation action. Here's a Aphanius transgredians from Turkey. It's a critically endangered species. It's on the verge of extinction in the wild. There are a few populations of those in captivity. And without those backup populations, uh, if we lose the species completely in the wild in Turkey, there will never be a hope for returning that, that species to the wild in the future. The third category under the conservation banner is supplementation. And these are species for which ex situ breeding and release back into the wild immediately may benefit the population if it's part of the recommended conservation action. And here we have an example of lake sturgeon, and there are a number of North American aquariums that are involved in Head Start projects where they're breeding them and releasing those animals back into the wild to supplement the wild populations. The next big category is research, and under research we have two subcategories. The first one is conservation research, and those are species that are undergoing specific applied research that directly contributes to their conservation of that species, or it could be a related species that we're learning from, and it protects either them directly or their habitats in the wild. Under general research, zoos and aquariums have been involved for many years inviting students in to, to do general applied research that will increase our knowledge of either, either their natural history, population management or breeding biology, um, husbandry or disease, risk management, health issues. Education, the next one also has two subcategories underneath it. Conservation education includes species that are recommended for a clearly defined educational purpose that either inspires our visitors, raises awareness of environmental issues, 
or increases our knowledge of conservation issues or projects associated with that species or its habitat. So that's where the species that we have campaigns about trying to raise awareness of biodiversity loss, they could fall under that conservation education category. And the last one is general education. And these are species that are managed collectively. Again, I have to stress that amongst multiple institutions, if they have a clearly defined educational role for maybe their remarkable appearance, something about their behavior or natural history, that's a particular interest to our visitors and we need to manage them in a larger uh, population. So they are general education. I also point out that a species can, f can fill more than one role in our uh, population. So it can be a conservation, it could be an arc species, but at the same time we could be doing research on it and it could also be a species that we have an educational program surrounded. So it can actually fill more than one role. But if it doesn't fill any of those ro roles, then it's not part of the regional collection plan. If a species is display limited, in other words, it doesn't fill any one of those seven roles, and it clearly makes no contribution to any of those activities, then the species would not appear on the RCP. And I would argue that that fish definitely should not belong on the regional collection plan. Beautiful though it is. Um, so decision trees, making decisions. Every day uh, a curator, a collection manager has to make decisions about which species they keep in their collection. And the decision tree for the regional collection plan helps them do that. So it's just a series of yes or no questions that guide the curator through the sorting process and help them determine which species should form part of the RCP. I'm gonna run through the, the decision tree now so you get an understanding of how it works. There's initially some general considerations Obviously, the most important, if we're talking about captive management, is whether or not the species can be maintained in captivity, or is there enough evidence to suggest it can be maintained in captivity? Basking sharks, I would argue not, although some people keep whale sharks, but that's not for me to judge. So if the answer to that is yes, we go down to question two. If the answer is no, then of course that, that species is not on the RCP. However, we could use it as a focus for a campaign um, awareness raising or research in situ, so in, in the wild. Next question is, does the species or a significant subpopulation have specific conservation concerns? The answer is yes. We go to question three. If it's no, then it won't form part of the RCP as a conservation species. However, we could go down and jump to the next section, part B, and discuss whether or not it has a research or an education role. So if we say yes, we go to question three. Is the species globally extinct in the wild or is the population locally extinct in the wild? If the answer is yes, then it becomes an ARC species and it's eligible to be included on the regional collection plan, provided that we've developed an action plan for it afterwards. If the answer is no, we go to question four. Is the species at risk of global extinction or the population at risk of local extinction in the wild. In other words, those species that are critically endangered, according to IUCN. Then this takes us down two paths. Either yes, we go to question five, no, we go to question six. If the answer is yes, question five, is captive breeding considered part of the recommended actions to conserve the species? If the answer is yes, it fits under the, the rescue category. Um, this one I use specific uh, Afanius example from Algeria. If you look at this species on the IUCN red list, it's probably extinct in the wild now, but part of the recommendations for its conservation is to develop a conservation captive breeding program for it. The answer is no, we must investigate further. Why is this species um, possible for the RCP? We know that the red list um, has a massive task um, and has always playing catch up because the status of species changes all the time. So we might need to do some more investigation. However, if the previous question was no and it jumped us up to question six, we need to ask, will captive breeding and supplementation of wild populations benefit the survival of the species and reduce the risk of its extinction in the wild? And again, this is the case of the sturgeon in North America. If the answer is yes to that then the species can potentially form a supplementation role. Part B then jumps down. So if we get through this whole process and a species either does or doesn't fit, 
we then need to go through the research and education and we ask ourselves a series of questions. If we jump down to no, the species is not a conservation one on the RCP and we go to part B and C and we sort through it to determine whether or not um, the species can fit into either of those categories. I won't go through all of those now because it's a similar process and I hopefully think you get the idea by now. After we've been through that, we then need to look at our second stage of decision making. So we've initially decided, yes, the species fits under one of those three broad categories. We have a more defined role. Then we need to look at whether or not animals are even available. Because if there's species that aren't in captivity already, we need to consider some perhaps difficult decisions. Do we need to go into the wild and collect them? And if we need to do that, what's the appropriate number of founders? You know, geneticists have many theories over um, the number of founders that will make a long sustaining population in captivity. And the research is changing and it's different for different species. We also have to look at whether or not there's enough space. I mentioned only 345 institutions in EASA. Of course, there's other aquariums that are outside of EASA. We also have the hobbyist sector that help out. But how many holders do we need in order to secure the survival of that species? And of course, are there any legal considerations? In the past, people would smuggle fish, and sometimes it still happens today, um, in and out of countries. But within EASA, we have a responsibility to make sure all of our activities are perfectly legal. We have to make sure that we have correct permits and licensing. If it's a CITES species, we have to make sure all the paperwork is in order. Then we have lots and lots of other specific questions. Um, when taking on a species? Do we have space? Do we have the expertise? Do we have enough staff to look after them? How much is it going to cost to maintain them over time? Are there any known health issues? Many of our existing program fish have diseases that we don't have cures for. Mycobacterium is prevalent in many captive populations. No cure, very devastating to captive, captive populations. Are there other regional programs? So Scott you know, mentioned AZA in North America. If they're working with the species already, does it make sense for Europe to be working with the same species? So maybe we can let them do that species and we work on something else. How easy is it to maintain them? How easy it is it to breed them? If it's incredibly difficult, time consuming or costly to breed them, we need to factor that into our decisions. And there's things like longevity. Is it a fast reproducing fish? Does it die really quickly? We need to have a really strong breeding program in place because with some species, if they live for only two years, we can quickly lose them from our collections if we're not developing a good breeding management program for them. And conversely, fecundity, if we have a species that produces thousands and thousands of fry, there's a very risk, a real risk of saturating the gene pool with the genes from just a few number of founders. So we have to develop very, very strong breeding protocols. The program has its own requirements. What level of management do we want for the species? So do we want to monitor them as individual species or so one person is coordinating that species? Or can we let one person coordinate a whole species group? Within EASA, there's different levels of management. We have ESBs, which involve a stud book, and we have EEPs, which are very high level of management. They're international. Those are the, the programs that are used primarily for big mammals like tigers, and they're incredibly complicated and expensive to run. There's also a third category, which is the monitoring programs, and those are programs that don't involve stud book and genetic management, but it just involves a person keeping tabs on what's happening um, within the, the populations within Europe. Do we have a coordinator available? Um, we're dealing with hundreds of species. Is there enough people around to be able to manage them? What is our population target? What are we ultimately trying to achieve in captivity and for how many years? And do we have a breeding strategy? I mentioned an action plan is the, the final stage um, of RCP development. And the action plan is probably the biggest level of work that needs to happen. This provides detailed information about the management of the species within the RCP. And the species coordinators and individual institutions use that in order to steer the management plan to set their targets and measure the effectiveness of their program. It's usually completed, completed by the species coordinator, but of course they can't do it on their own. They need to get in help from other experts in the field. 
and through their own investigation and research to ensure that a properly managed program is created. The action plan includes lots and lots of information. Um, the date, who pulled it together, which species it's dealing with, the distribution, their conservation status, any known threats, which RCP categories the species fits under, what is the level of management? Is it a monitoring program or an ESB? Husbandry guidelines are also included here if they're available, who the actual coordinator is, who's the point of contact, and of course, the goal and objectives, as well as the actions and timeframes that are needed in order to meet those goals and objectives. And of course, that needs to be continually updated. There's some specific information that's also included. Um, what is the target population? If we're saying the species has a conservation role, we need to make sure that we have enough of them actively reproducing and surviving in captivity to meet that. Um, are there current research activities? I mentioned disease earlier. Um, disease research is a really, really important area when it comes to fishes that we need to increase rapidly if we're to manage these species in captivity. And if it's an education species, what is our message? And is it a message that translates across multiple countries? So is the same message going to be appropriate in Sweden as it would be in the UK or in Greece? We would also include in the action plan any in-situ work. It's really important for a cohesive action plan to develop links in country where the species is from in order to make it a more robust project. Of course, references are always important. So now that I've explained to you a bit about what the RCP consists of, I'm going to focus a bit more on a workshop we had last year in Vienna, hosted by Vienna Zoo. And the focus um, of that workshop was the freshwater fish group. And we decided to focus more specifically um, on species only that fit in that conservation category of the RCP. And we wanted to do that for very specific reasons. There's a level of urgency. I mean, every day species are becoming extinct and freshwater fishes are one of the most threatened taxonomic groups in the world. We had time restrictions. We only had two days in the workshop. And um, of course, I mentioned the limited number of holding spaces. So we had to work very quickly. We didn't want to um, devote lots of time sifting species out that became, for example, an education species. And they would take up space for something more urgent um, that could house a conservation species that was about to become extinct. And at the workshop, of course, we had a limited number of participants, so we had to work fast um, and we had to, to work very quickly um, and intelligently. So the focus was um, on freshwater fishes. Of course, with over 14,000 species of freshwater fishes, um, we had to, to pare that down somewhat in order to have a manageable group. And we decided before the workshop to focus on nine families. They were pre-selected based on knowing that those families had species with a conservation concern. And we also knew that there are species that can be maintained in captivity um, relatively easily. These are the nine families that we chose. Um, you're probably familiar with most of them. Um, even with this, you can see that there's a large number of species that had to be dealt with. And obviously, we couldn't sift through all of them over the course of two days. So the idea, one of the key things was to identify a coordinator for each of those families with uh, co-coordinators that would help um, with developing the RCP for each of those family groups. We had 27 participants from nine countries. And because the zoo community had a limited number of people available. We also reached out to the other sectors, so research institutions and universities. And there was a number of people there from the hobbyist sector, which often these guys have got tremendous amount of knowledge, expertise with breeding and husbandry of some of these species. So they were a really valuable um, asset to the group. We also wanted to give the participants some tools um, to help understand the process of selection a bit better um, and where we were ultimately going. So we had a population manager there from EASA, and she was specifically introducing the concepts of group management. So not talking about individual species, but managing populations as groups, because often we can't identify individuals of, of fish 
um, of many species in, in our populations. We also looked at metapopulations. Um, these are obviously populations held over multiple institutions, which is absolutely essential for an, a regional collection plan because we wanted to avoid bottlenecks in our populations. Some of the, the species, the families that we were um, looking after, the cichlids, for example, historically, many of those populations in captivity suffered from extreme bottlenecks in, um, in captive populations, which have completely collapsed the program in a very short period of time. And you can just look at the um, Lake Victoria Species Survival Plan in North America um, and how that went from having dozens and dozens of species when it was first started in the 1980s to now there's less than a handful left. And in large part, that was due to the genetic bottlenecks that occurred. We wanted to look at things like founder numbers and asking some questions, how many do we need? In the past, we were told you need to have at least 50 founders, 25 males, 25 females, in order to maintain genetic integrity over 100 years time. Some of the Geneticists are telling us now that we don't necessarily need that many. It depends on the species, um, and so in some cases, as few as 15 founders would be sufficient to maintain a stable genetic population over time. We also wanted to talk about the risks of transferring animals between institutions. We know that if we were forming metapopulations, we would periodically need to move fish from one place to the next, but obviously there's risks of doing that. Um, disease transfer from one institution to the next, the cost of moving animals from one institution to the next. So how frequently did we need to do that in order to maintain those populations? The IUCN came, Will Darwall gave a really good um, introduction to the IUCN Red List. Because we were focusing on the conservation of species, we wanted to use the Red List as a tool for help us sorting through our species. Um, so we use that as our first step. Obviously, the second step in the decision-making process involved the experts that were in the room. We had 27 people from all over the place, um, so they had quite a bit of knowledge. And then the third step was to make a note of those species that we needed to do further investigation on after the workshop ended. So just to recap on how our freshwater fish RCP was developed, it's a full, it starts with a full taxonomic list. So if we're looking at one family, um, Melanotania day, for example, we need to review every single species. And the, the first page of the RCP, in our case, we used an Excel spreadsheet, lists every single species within that taxon. And here's where fish base is very, very handy. Um, so we use that as a starting point. We list the scientific and common name, geographical range, looking at its IUCN category, if there is one, and the date of assessment. And then we ask those simple questions that we talked about in the decision tree. Can it be, main, be maintained in captivity? Are there conservation concerns? And are there further actions? Only when all of those questions were answered sufficiently does it make it to the second page, which is the actual RCP. So many species at that point completely get discarded. And it, because of the number of species we're dealing with, in many cases, it became more of an exercise of saying, what can we get rid of rather than what should we include? You know, we're trying to constantly pare down the list to make it manageable. So on that second page, we have the same thing. Those species, their category, do they fit under it? In this case, we were only looking at conservation. We wanted to also have some idea of what the ex situ population is. Um, and any immediate actions. Do we need to go and secure more fish of that species? Um, how many institutions do we need to involve? Is it enough for one institution to have multiple populations, or do we need to spread the load over many different places? Um, and of course, how many individuals? What's our target number over time? Um, is it enough to maintain 100 fish from year to year, or do we need to look at thousands of individuals? So after the RCP has been created, the next step, and then the real work comes in, the inventory, who is keeping the species. That means having to go out and talk to the, the aquariums, the zoos, the hobbyists, and find out who's actually holding those species that we're concerned with. And how many individuals in total are in captive care? Where did they come from? Did they all come from a single import of 
you know, six fish from the 1960s and they've been spread everywhere, do we then need to go and do some genetic work to find out how inbred that population is? Action planning, husbandry research, do we need to learn more about how to keep and breed those species in captivity? And of course, looking at in situ links, the program will be much stronger if we've developed links in country um, with researchers that are um, concerned with the conservation of the species in the wild. So where are we now? Well, it's only a year since then, and I think we've made some good progress. Bear in mind that most of the people that attended the workshop have day jobs and had other things that they needed to be doing. But we've managed to find coordinators for eight of the nine families that we pre-selected. And the regional collection plan for three of the families has been completed. And the rest of them are still a work in progress, but we are making good progress. Um, many, many species uh, to sift through. Um, so there's still a tremendous amount of, of work that needs to happen. Um, and of course, once all of that work is done, the coordinators then need to start to draft and develop the inventories for species. And then the next stage, which is the action plans. So some of them have been really, really good. I think the ones that have progressed the most are the ones with the fewest number of species uh, in their group. Um, but it's good, and it's, it's a learning process. It's in a growing process. Um, that's pretty much where we're at now with that. Um, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Yes? Okay. Second question. It seems like a tremendous amount of paperwork. Yes. Okay. First question. Um, I've just come from the European Aquarium Curators meeting in Tenerife, and marine fishes was the subject. Um, so we gave our report within Phytag. We have elasmobranchs, the sharks and rays is one group, and I have a co-chair that deals with them. Um, we have freshwater fishes, which is the, the new sub-tag, which uh, Tony Weisenbacher from Vienna is dealing with. And the, the next subject is the marine teleos. And we've just appointed a new curator as of two days ago. Um, and the, the role of that tag will be slightly different, just as there's a, a big difference between the elasmobranchs and the freshwater fishes. So the marine tag, um, is going to be focused primarily on developing sustainable populations and looking at breeding protocols um, within captive populations. Aquariums and zoos come under a tremendous amount of criticism from the public over where we get our animals from. Animal rights groups are always setting their sights on, on zoos and increasingly on aquariums. So what we're looking at now is trying to develop sustainable protocols for those animals in our collections. And if it means that a species can best be acquired from the wild through a sustainable harvest, similar to what Scott was mentioning in Brazil, um, we will do that and we will defend that decision. Um, but it's looking at that overall group. And I think the regional collection plan for marine fishes will look very, very differently than, it, than the way we approached it for freshwater fishes. There's probably a, a greater role for research and, and coordinated research among institutions for marine teleos and also for education. You know, you think of um, Nemo, for example, and you know, the, the huge impact that that film had. Um, it, there will probably be more coordinated um, education species that come out on the marine teleos. And your second question about paperwork. Um, yes, it's a huge amount of paperwork and um, to be honest, the people that are doing all this paperwork are often doing it in their own time. Because um, I said they've got a day job, they're doing multiple things, and this really expresses the dedication of, of those people in trying to get this work done when they're sitting there at midnight on their computers trying to, to develop a regional collection plan and an action plan for these species. And this is where we've really um, realized in recent years that we can enlist the support from hobbyists 
because oftentimes they've got tremendous amount of specific knowledge on those species and they're quite happy to be sitting on their computer at midnight you know because it's their passion and their interest so it's trying to enlist the people that are willing to do the work and help us out so we can pull together the the whole plan one second yeah, i'm just curious approximately how many species are you maintaining in captivity now how many species uh, overall it, within European? Conservation. Conservation species, okay. Well, um, at the moment, because the, RC, the three RCPs that have been completed in are only in draft form, um, and the inventories haven't been done yet. So the next stage, uh, Gudeads have been done, um, and uh, the Pseudomugles, uh, uh, Blue Eyes have been done, and Australian Rainbow Fishes. Um, the next stage will be to find out exactly how many of those are being kept. And I suspect for some families in Europe, the number being kept will be quite low. Um, but once we start to ask those questions, we'll have a greater idea. I know in my institution, um, we're keeping about 40 species now that we call program fish. They're not officially on the RCP yet, but I suspect they will. You know, we keep six species that are extinct in the wild. And, you know, without a question, when that work's been completed, they will feature on the RCP. Några fler frågor? We're all set. Wait. Uh, how do you... Obviously, uh, this with uh, conservation and all this, how do you plan to reintroduce these pieces into the wild again? Uh, uh, thinking about uh, vectors and uh, what could happen when you take fish from Europe and put it back to, uh, to Brazil, for instance. Yeah, a very, very good question and one that I get asked all the time. Um, I think there's a couple of things related to that question. One is um, people have said to me, and I find this personally quite horrifying, when they say, if there's no habitat left, what's the point? And I even get this from people within the zoo and aquarium community. Now, I think, you know, I love animals and biodiversity, and my job is to try and stop extinction. I feel very much, you know, if we don't do something now to preserve these species in captivity, regardless of whether or not their habitat exists now or not, um, we will lose large numbers of animals. And I think that the captive management is oftentimes a last resort. Um, and it's still something that needs, it's increasingly recognized by IUCN and other agencies that are involved in conservation that zoos and aquariums are gonna have a growing role to play um, in species conservation by having captive populations. Now, I find it's very much buying time. You know, we're doing, it's like, we don't have time to sit back and develop a full plan and say, oh, let's look at the risk of disease reintroduction into the wild. You know, is this a big enough risk and should we stop getting uh, the management of these captive populations because there's a risk that down the road this could happen? I think we need to just say, look, these are the species and the RCP helps us develop those species lists. When it comes to the future and the potential reintroduction, there are whole guidelines related to this. You know, the reintroduction specialist group under IUCN has very strict criteria of disease screening that animals have to have before they would be uh, reintroduced into their population. Of course, they also have to have uh, the habitat restored. You know, and I mentioned the pupfish is one of my favorite um, fishes. And to me, one of the things that really interests me about it is some of these species came from very, very tiny habitats. And the habitats dis were destroyed because of groundwater abstraction for agriculture. So if we could rehabilitate that, that groundwater source and restore that spring, we could introduce that species back in there. Oftentimes it was the only fish found in there. And I've been talking to various people about the feasibility of doing something, you know, in a space where you, you actually, for once, consider the watershed in your protected area boundary and, and make sure that that is intact so that you can have that species and the species acts as a flagship for restoration of ecology. My project in Greece, we've just this year been looking at 
um, translocation of fish. So it's not a reintroduction, but it's two translocation actions. One's an assisted migration, and the other one's a supplementation. And these fall under that IUCN boundaries. But this project is 10 years. This year is the 10th year before we've conducted the first translocations. And part of that was a tremendous amount of research into the disease issues, um, parasite loading of the fish in the wild, but also looking at the genetic integrities of the different populations and the sympatric species to make sure that we're not actually creating a bigger ecological problem by moving the fish from one place to the other. Någon annan? Som ni ser, det är ett bra sätt att ställa frågor. Då får Brian möjlighet att bry ut och, och prata lite mer. Uh, does the Nagoya protocol affect your activities? Yes, of course. I mean, all of that has to be factored in. I mean, I, I would say increasingly more and more protocols like the Nagoya protocol um, will constrain what we can do. I mean, it, the, I mentioned earlier about the, um, the different regional programs and AZA versus EASA and you know just our ability to to move animals from one place to, to another legally um, and without risk um, is is a is a real issue you know and we have to be aware of that and and completely um, willing to work under the, all of those policies and and legal restrictions and I think that's in the past where um, people have come unstuck by not observing those protocols. So yeah, very much so. Någon annan? Nej. Då tackar vi Brian för hans föredrag. Thank you. Thank you.